Nathaniel, it's, uh, it's an interesting way to start this interview in the fact that you have had such a diverse life. Um, they are profiling tonight on ESPN 3030, the fall from grace of Lance Armstrong. Mm. Your story goes the other way. I yeah. mean, you have built your castle from below ground zero, if you will. Yeah, I'd say that's fair. And, you know, that spectrum is incredibly large. So to start with, I just have to maybe ask you, and to open the this Pandora's box, if you will, mm -hmm. who is Nathaniel Linville? Who who is he? Yeah, who, who is? <laughs> how how would you define who you are at this stage of your of your life? Um, you know that's a that's a a, a really big question. Um, I I don't know. I, I think that um, I think I I like fishing a lot, and that's a big part of my identity. So the way that it's expressed now is with records and tournaments. Um, I put in a lot of work doing that stuff. Um, and it matters a lot to me. I'm a member of the community down here. So I'm involved with the Guides Association and IGFA and BTT. Um, but the, the sort of side current to that story is, you know, I'm also a, an addict in recovery. Um, and that that's part of that story. And obviously to, to your earlier point, it's better looking down at that rather than looking, you know, up at it, like looking down at where you came from rather than looking sure. down at where you fell from. I mean, you're on Everest now. Yeah. You're at the top. Yeah. In some ways, for sure. For sure. Yeah. And especially compared to, you know, the, the crevasse, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's different, you know, when you, um, when you fall to the bottom in the, in the, uh, K Kumbu Icefall, if I'm if I'm getting my Everest sure. uh, trivia right, right. Um, but but I don't know. I mean, I don't. I, I'll be honest with you. I don't spend a lot of time like wondering who I am on a on a daily basis. Yeah, for I'm sure. I'm more interested in what I, what I do, I guess. Right, for sure not. But let me just say, I, I talked to Steve Huff last night, uh -huh. and just recently for the audience. Nathaniel has broken the two pound permit record just recently with a 15 pound fish. Yeah. He just broke uh, the six pound tarpon record with a 143 pound fish with Steve Huff. Yeah. Your wife broke uh, a permit record, women's permit record. Yeah. So obviously, you guys, as a family, your DNA is in incredibly successful. I called Steve last night. I said, Steve, I, I'd like to have you just give me some statement about Nathaniel. Mm. And together, you guys, over the last, I think, nine years have been chasing this particular record. Yeah, with, with no success <laughs> until, until well, recently. That's, <laughs> a, that's a big task, right, you yeah. know. But uh, Steve Huff says, Nathaniel is a dedicated, maniacal fisherman. He eats and breathes how to make it better, the size and shape of each little feather. He buys into it in a big way. Okay, and with that being said, and knowing you, yeah. Nikki has nicknamed you Socrates <laughs> because of of your passionate, uh, determined way to make everything better. But Steve also went on to say that he that you are the best he's ever seen. Mm. And for somebody like Steve Huff saying this angler is the best he's ever seen is saying something. He's been around a long time and he's the god of guides, as we all know. And he said this, you're the best he's ever seen. Wow. And for a fishing guy to take somebody like you out fishing that can get it done makes the push pole lighter and a whole lot easier. <laughs> I mean, what a great compliment. Yeah, a, a, an incredibly nice compliment. And I, I would say the same thing about Steve. I mean, Steve is a guy that when you fish with him, you don't, it's very easy to fish with him. Like it, he makes the, you know, every cast is a little bit closer. Every fish is a little bit more inclined to bite. Um and and that's the nature of I think someone like him, and that's that's a huge difference. Um, and yeah, Steve is uh, there's a reason that he has the reputation that he has, right? Uh, unquestionably. And, and we'll get into that dynamic a little bit, but let's go back to your upbringing, if sure. You don't, if you don't mind, yeah. You know, we're talking about the abyss that you went through, but let's just talk about your childhood, possibly, yeah. and and how you were raised, what kind of family you came from. I know that your dad was a sailor and your yeah. mom was a fisherman. Yeah, so my mom was the president of the Woman Fly Fishers, which was a, a club of women that I think it was started, um, I want to say at some point in the early 1900s, where women who 
their their husbands fished and there was no way for them to really do it a lot of the clubs back then were all guys clubs um so we as as a family grew up fishing primarily through my mom and my dad got into it later i think because of her and sort of continually after i was born he got pulled into it but it was always him toward her not you know not the other way around um and they're both great people. They they still fish. They fish down here every year. Um, and my mom loves trout fishing. So Kat and I have been to New Zealand with them trout fishing, which is fun for us. I mean, mostly because it's spending time with my parents. It's completely yeah. different. But yeah, yeah. So what was your childhood like? Um, I remember that I hated school, like deeply hated school. And why? I, I don't know. I, I think that school, like... It, it was a, a controlled sort of environment, um, and it's it it was just too predictable. Maybe um, socially, it was really hard for me, like to be in that group of people year after year, um, and just like the idea that I never had time for myself. You know, I used to have like really vivid dreams about like running away from school, and I think at one point I actually did run away from school. And you're not a sportsman. No, no, I never. I mean, I played like you know third varsity played rock like, fights yeah, exactly <laughs> right yeah <laughs> but nothing traditional that's right yeah how did how did your um at what were you a wild child um i wasn't until my my teenage years i think as a child i was pretty i mean i i didn't like school and i wanted to be outdoors but i was you know i, I was doing fun things and sort of productive things but the wild years started for me you know maybe 15 or 16. and how did those begin um, I mean, it's, it, I think I started, I started smoking weed, but also I just started becoming more, um, focused on things that were like what I perceived to be sort of going against the grain of school and sort of structure. Um, and a lot of that stuff is healthy, but some of it was not. But, um, as soon as I, I had the agency to like, not want to go to school or, not get carried along by what people were telling me to do. I rebelled against that really, really hard. And how would you act out against that? Um, I mean, I stopped really working in school. So I didn't, like I would, school for me was a, a way to get through the minimum, with the minimum amount of work. Um, and uh, I don't know, I just, I just didn't have any like interest in what was going on around me. Um, I did, I did like fishing a lot. I wanted to be away from any sort of structure. So. And when you were younger, I think you made, you made mention that Joan Wolfe may have had an influence, you know, yeah. the introduction to her. Yeah, I mean, and I, I think it was probably Joan, but my mom, when I was like really little, I remember going, to, and I, I wish I, I knew more about who was there, but I walked into this, I think it was like the living room of our house, and I was, I was a kid, right? So I was probably making noise at a time when I shouldn't have been. And uh, my mom said, look, you know, you need to you know, straighten up because this, this person's a really good fisherman. And I, I think that it was Joan, she was talking, it may, it may have been another of the women fly fishers. Um, but I remember being like really taken with that idea that, that someone could be a good fisherman. Um, because even at a young age, I kind of knew that I liked fishing, but I, I couldn't, I mean, I was a child, right? I can't cast the rod the way my, my dad does or my mom does. Like there was a, an age, you know, issue there, like a coordination problem. Right. Um, and being introduced to that person in that way also sort of introduced me to the idea that there can be, that being a good fisherman is like a good angler, is, is a thing that someone can become. And I remember being completely taken with that. And to this day, like that's... That's what I think about. That's like, I just want to be a good fisherman. Yeah, because that was a little bit earlier than your teenage years where you kind of went awry. Yeah, and, and I think got those, into the drug stuff. Yeah, I think those are just, I mean, you know, addiction is a, a thing that, that happened. But it didn't, it didn't, like at that time prior to that, I was still who I am now. Right. Like, and that's probably like the best time to look for something in my life that's similar to, to me now. Because it was on uh, th those two are sort of bookends to this to this other For side, sure. yeah, the other story rather. What um, 
So let's get back into those teenage years. Sure. You, you went to a bunch of different schools. Yeah, like you, seven or eight of them. Yeah, and you were saying that uh, you were, you know, involved with girls and cocaine, and oh, they yeah. were shipping you all around. Tell, oh, tell yeah. me a little bit about that that debauchery, I mean, if it, you will. It was, I mean, I, you know, it's it's a funny story, right? Because I now was, it is. Well, I was going to private schools, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, I tried to go to public school, but my parents whether wisely or not, told me that, you know, that that wasn't going to happen. I think they probably, like, didn't want me around the house, and I (laughs) I can't blame them. Um, But there were all these, like, semester programs or, like, years abroad that I could apply to. So I figured that out. Um, And I don't know if I was just trying to solve my problems by, like, a geographical cure or not, but... But you weren't um, trying to solve problems. You were probably just... No, I mean, trying to solve problems in that, like, I wasn't happy. Right. So trying to solve that problem. Okay. Um, and thinking, oh, if I go live on this farm in Vermont and study, like, you know, the, the outdoors, that that will somehow fill this, like, this hole that I feel or, or, right. or whatever. It's kind Did of you always feel that hole? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Even as a younger person? Yeah, definitely. Was that anxiety or was there probably. a lack of... of What's the word I'm thinking of? A lack like of fulfillment of some, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, some of that is normal, right? Like we right. all, um, like I still I still feel anxious if I'm in a room full of people or if I go to a tournament or something. And I, I don't think I'm alone in that. And I'm not trying no. to, I'm not trying to differentiate myself to the point where I'm saying I'm dealing with things that other people don't um, because that's not necessarily the case. I, I do think that that sort of constant like anxiety in school um, made me like I, I i was not prepared to deal with it so masking it through drugs probably oh. yeah yeah i mean it, it didn't but it it appeared Exen- to <laughs> yeah. when i For did that it would accentuate it the whole right, anxiety yeah, yeah. issue well but i think that's like it's it's a it's a it's a deep mix right of maybe maybe those things are more um they they exist in bigger quantities or maybe i'm just less capable of dealing with them and to say that it's one or the other, I think would be unfair because it's probably both. Like I probably did have some higher level of anxiety or some greater amount of discomfort in in those structured school environments. But to say that, you know, I, I experienced so much that, you know, there was no way out for me is also not really fair because right. I chose to deal with it in ways that were not productive and probably ultimately, not probably, for sure, ultimately contributed to more of that. And that's a sort of like, you know, the pattern of a problem, where's this feedback loop of it getting worse. And you got expelled from school when you were a junior or a senior. Yeah, something like that, yeah. And, and then what happened after that? Well, I went to went to college for, <laughs> for six months. Um, and uh, that was I can only imagine predictably you. disastrous. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was not, um, I mean. It, Pretty. No, and, and look, the, the fact of the matter is that I was, I was unhappy, you know. I mean, and that's. That's like an honest assessment. Sure. You know, it's, uh, what were the drugs of choice back then? Oh, back then it was cocaine and Ritalin and Adderall, um, weed, alcohol, you know, all of... All, I wasn't turning much down, but that's what, right. what was around for me not to say no to. But it evolved to a higher level of, yeah. of drugs. What was the worst? I mean, the by the time I got clean, you know, Oxy was big in South Florida. Um and a lot of people don't understand the whole sort of opiate situation. But the, the brief rundown is that oxycodone is a, a strong opiate drug that historically was mixed with Tylenol for drugs like Percocet, Percodan, whatever. Um, and then Purdue Pharma came out with OxyContin, which was a continuous release form of oxycodone. Um, and they, they oversold it. Um, whether they did it because they were stupidly idiotic or idiotically stupid, like or criminally negligent or negligent to the point of criminality, that's going to be up to the courts to decide. Right. Um, but suffice to say, in South Florida, the the pill mills and the pain clinics here had sort of injected, for lack of a better term, this tremendous amount of opiate drugs like into the the, the system. The, the system. Yeah. And so for people like myself who were using drugs, they became like really available where they maybe hadn't been before. And there was less stigma because they were pharmaceutical instead of heroin. Um, so in terms of the worst, I mean, look, any any addiction to any drug is 
is its own kind of hell. And I'm, I'm cautious to say that, you know, using certain drugs does not make a problem worse. But in terms of drugs that are hard to get off of and that drugs that cause a physical um, sort of dependence on them, um, opiates are among the hardest to get off of because it, it just so happens that the withdrawal symptoms of opiate drugs are very similar. I'm sorry, they're opposite to the effects of the drug. So if you take heroin, you feel warm and confident and sort of comforted. And if you don't have it, you feel, you know, you get the chills and you cold. feel it's the opposite of that. Yeah. So where you felt, you know, warm, you feel cold. And where you feel confident, you feel, you know, sort of eviscerated. And how much heroin were you doing? I didn't, you know, I, I did I did a little bit of heroin towards the end mm -hmm. of my drug use, but primarily it was oxy that I was doing. Right. Um, and how much, I mean, you know, more than enough to kill the three of us if we yeah. if we had it here in front of us yeah. daily. Well, you moved to South Florida, I think it was Key West in like 2005. Yeah, for the first time. For yep. the first time. And when did you buy the store here? The so I didn't company. buy it. I opened it right. in 2009. Right. Um, but that and, period of time, you were pretty high. and Yeah, and, definitely. I mean, I lived in New York for a while um, and I, I bounced around. There was some, some time in L.A. There was some time, you know, I mean, just moving around sort of more of the same. Um, and then I, I kind of got grounded here in that I, I had something I wanted to do. So I started to open the shop. This was in 2008. Right. Um, and what I, role did the shop play in you getting better and changing your life? Well, so, so I opened the store, um, and it was, you know, that was the height of the, um, financial crisis. Um, so I secured all the vendors and had the store and I was, you know, it was ready to go and it started working. And for the first, maybe I think it was about a year that the store was open, I was pulling money out of it. And I almost- To get um, high. Yeah. Yeah. To get high. And I took this thing that I really did care about and basically ruined it. And I had to call my parents and say, look, I, I'm, you know, I'm out of money. And they were like, what, how can that be? You know, the shop's doing well and this is like a great thing. And- was this um, the first time they knew that you were having trouble with drugs? Uh, yeah. I mean, they. I had always sort of um, played that down. And I'd always said, look, you know, it's it's mental problems and then it's this and it's that. Um, and I did that probably in retrospect as much for myself as, as for them to sort of deflect. Um, and To keep fooling yourself and, yeah. and, and talking yourself and into like, what you were doing is okay. Yeah, and that's one of the like the characteristics of that condition. Right. I mean, if people knew what, you know, if I knew what I was doing, I wouldn't have done it, right? So there has to be a certain amount of... Um, denial? Yeah, denial, but not only denial, like, but belief of something else instead. You know, it's one thing to say that something doesn't exist. It's right. another thing to call it something else and believe that. Right. Um, and what were you calling it at the time? I thought I, you know, I thought I had mental problems and I thought that I had, you know. Well, you did, obviously. Well, clearly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you still do. Yeah, un little, un unquestionably. But in yeah. a healthy way yeah. now. Yeah. But I, I think that's, I mean, that's that's one of the things about addiction, right, is it, it, it's a mental disease. It's when not did a, you realize you were addicted and you, you really need, yeah, you were in a hole that was going to you know, be hard to dig out of? It, it took, um, so I got clean in September of 2010. And how did you do that? Um, I, you know, th there's tons of help out there if people want it. Um, there's, there's people that get together and talk about these issues. Um, and I have to be careful for obvious reasons sure. about, you know, whether or not, like, it's not a promotional type thing. Um, but, but suffice to say, there is tons of help out there. And I was able to find that help three blocks from my house, five times a day. And all I had to do was go there and ask people what to do and follow suggestions and be, you know, honest about what my problem was, open minded to what was being told to me and willing to do it. And that was it. There you was were no... sick of it. You were ready to move on. Yeah. And I was I, I mean, the longer that I stayed clean, the more frightened I became because I started to watch people die. Um, I started to watch people that I knew who were trying to get clean, who relapsed and died. Um, so as uh, the more that I sort of spent time in that in that environment, I watched, you know, I, I buried a lot of friends mm. from that. Um, and I know I'm not the only one, you know, it's, you sort of get a little not desensitized, but you get less surprised by it. Were you ever questioning your own 
mortality with this? Absolutely, yeah. With all that. Yeah, I mean, the, the, like, the statistical likelihood. Right, it of, was going to happen. Yeah, of, of getting past where I was is just, it's, the math is not really good. Right. You were, you were talking the other night when I spoke with you about climbing out of a box. Sure. Which is similar to, you made this analogy of becoming the best fisherman. Explain that relationship. Well, I and think how they're similar. The two are. I mean, I, I think they are. Like for me, the the admission that like right, okay, I'm an addict and I need to do something about it, and I I want to get clean and stay clean. Um, you know, it's a difficult thing to do, but it's it's totally possible. But it, on some level, when I first got clean, I didn't know if I if I had it in me. You know, if I if I would be able to do it. Um, because I knew that the chances were low. So it took a lot of work and a lot of sort of ongoing like reflection on what I was doing and, and continuous and sort of you know, never ending pursuit of that. Um, and in a lot of ways, that, that kind of you know, continuous pressure in that direction is what it took for me. Because when I got clean, I had, I mean, I had an ego as a fisherman, but that was about it, <laughs> you know. Without, I, I without the results, exactly. Like no, 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 re, are, nothing you, to base it on. Just like thought you, I was you know, like hot the, shit. The yeah. first time I met you was about the time you, I think you first bought the place, and you sure. were still using. Yeah. And we had a big hearty dinner down here. Right. We were all together, yeah, and I yeah, just I met that. you. I kept thinking, wow, there's a lot of words coming out of his mouth. Yeah, for someone that doesn't know anything, but that was that's that's so typical, right? Of, it, of, and of I kept, that. it yeah. reminded me of myself because you know, as an athlete, a lot of times the older we get, the better we used to be. <laughs> Right? right. Ask anybody. <laughs> sure. And in the world of skiing, I think the opposite. I was a good skier. You know, I skied right. in two Olympics and whatever. But the, the more I look at it, my career was terrible. Yeah. I should have been so much better yeah. because I never took it as seriously as I have skiing. But when I look back at a lot of sound bites uh, from me being, a, you know, when I was at the skiing state, I look and I go, did I really say that? Right. What an asshole. Yeah. But I can see you now. I can, I can relate a lot to that. Yeah. Sometimes I look back at that, like that time in my life, and it, it's like it's just cringeworthy. Right. I mean, I and I'm I'm thinking like how how did I think that? Even discussing some of that because on on some level I feel like I'm discussing stuff that happened to me, but I I act like it happened to me, like it wasn't me that was doing it. Right. But I'm the one that did all that. Right. And it's the same thing. Like, I remember fishing in, in, like, the March Merkin with a really great friend of mine, like, at that time. And I, I was, like, I remember thinking, like, oh, it'd be pretty cool if we win this thing. Like, and I was, I was no one to be even considering that. Right. And, and I certainly don't feel that way now. Well, I'll, having, I'll, make you know, it, I'll make it simple. Back then, you and I would have never been great friends. Yeah, 100%. And now we are. And I didn't have you, a lot of great friends You are a different person. Then. You are yeah. a completely different man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, right. I'm, I'm glad for that. And yeah. I'm glad definitely that we're friends for sure. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, let's get into the fishing thing, you know, because you say, I want to I read something here. Sure. That you sent me the other day. Um, and this was a part of getting some intel on you. We spoke and you texted me this. You said, pre-tournaments, pre-major records. I was trying to catch a lemon shark on two pound test yeah. before the law changed, right? And you caught one at 41, yeah. but it did it high as a kite and wanted to have, have caught that fish clean mm. and ended up with a 78 pounder. Yeah. And then you won the Superfly tournament and the yeah. first, that was the first tournament you won. Yeah, so that was right when I got clean, was right. those things. This transition. Yeah. So when you catch, when you caught this two pound world record permit just recently, tell me about the relationship you've had in the past with two pound test. Well, so I, I first fished two pound with Fitz Coker, my cousin, and his wife, Dottie Ballantyne, who has, I, I don't, I'm gonna get this answer wrong, but you know, 170 odd world records. And this is when, when I first moved to Key West, we went out and you know, he was explaining to me, like you can catch a fish on two pound. And at that point, the two pound shark record was vacant. The whaler shark record, which is lemon sharks are included. Um, and I hooked a small lemon shark on two pound and we nearly had it, but it, you know, it, it came off, which is a recurring theme in my, in my fishing <laughs> career, like almost, and then, and then working really hard. Um, and uh, so I started fishing for that record with Aaron Snell um, and we, we had hooked, I mean, we used to hook, like, you know, it's pretty easy to hook a shark on a fly rod. You chum them up and then you throw a big red fly at them and they, they bite it. 
Um, so we, we had all these near misses and we finally caught one that was, I think, 41 and a half pounds. But when I did it, I was, I was high. And I really didn't like that because it was a record that I'd spent a lot of time on. Um, and I, look, I know there, there's a discussion to be had about the quality of different species and shark records are maybe not the most shiny of the sort of trophy sure. records you can get. But, it's but a start. It, was, it was important it was, to me. Yeah. And so they were going to change the law about, um, and this is a time when, like, I was just clean. I was hanging out with my buddy, Michael Hetzel, who's just one of my favorite people in the world. I owed a bunch of dealers money, and I'm, like, riding my bike around town with my buddy, Mike, you know, just as, like, personal protection, essentially. <laughs> was he a big muscle guy? Oh, yeah. I mean, Mike is, he's about, I'd put Mike up against Dustin. And you can tell, you can tell wow. Dustin that. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, but, uh but so we would we were just fishing all the time and it was actually a really nice time in my life because for the first time i i, I wasn't getting high and i was really putting in the work in that part of my life um and aaron and i won the superfly that year which was sort of out of nowhere this this great affirmation of what i was doing and then we went out to the marquesas with it was aaron and then bear and travis were with us we brought as many people as we could to help us get the thing in the boat which had always been the problem point um, and at that time, we were trying to catch the biggest fish on two pound fly, um, which was hilariously a 78 and a half pound sailfish. Um, and uh, so we caught a 78 pound shark. So we were short of that. But it was a record and, and it was uh, it was a really cool thing. Right. Yeah. And that time was just it was nice. You know, I was working at the shop. I'd signed over the, the business to my parents. So I was basically working in a fly shop, getting my life together, like starting, you know, at the bottom. Right. And and how important was that to get the shop back and pay your mom back? Well, it was, I mean, it was incredibly it was probably, important. Probably and, everything. Yeah, it was. And and the shop is something that, you know, it's, it's rare that you can like lose as much of your sort of touch of reality as I had and walk away on the, like walk through that to the other side and retain anything sort of concrete, like a business or any sort of asset like that. Um, so it became like, and it took me a long time to pay her back. It took me eight years to to pay off that that debt. Um, but it it's given me a, a real sense of like ownership of the store, and uh, I mean I I love it. You know? And of your life. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and and all those things. You know, I mean, if you, I had to work hard enough for those things that they they matter to me a lot. Tell me the next phase of your fishing career. You know, um, you got the two pound shark record. You won the, yeah, the, so the super fly. I was fishing with John uh, O'Hearn, who you know well. And uh, we it, initially, I had approached John to fish the Gold Cup. And he and I had sort of talked about it. And I got to the point where he started saying to me, like, look, I think, I think you're ready to fish that tournament. And um, uh, for some reason, I was looking for a guide in the Merkin. And I said, you know, John, let's do the, the March Merkin together. And he said, uh, well, look, I, you know, I don't really want to. And I said, look, we, you know, come on, make a commitment. I mean, we're doing let's the Gold start. Cup. Let's let's do this, you know. So I uh, I fished the Merkin with him. And the first year we fished the Merkin, I think I'd caught maybe, I don't know, 10 or 15 permit in my life. And the first day we get out to the flat and it's real, real like cloudy. And I see a mud and I throw the fly and I hook a permit and it immediately breaks off. And the first day, I think Doug and Ned Johnson caught one. And the next day, John and I went out and we caught two. And they were giants. I mean, one was 28 pounds, still the, one of the heaviest permit I've ever caught. And then we caught another one right before lines out, right next to Rob, um, who was fishing with Tony Nobregas. And uh, so we were way out in the lead. And on the last day, we didn't catch one. And, uh, and we, we get back in and guys are like, hey, you know, congratulations. No one had caught anything. Um, and they said, you know, congratulations. And I was like, typically, you know, oh, it's, a, that, it's not over yet, but thanks. And Scott Collins and Greg Smith came back. They were the last boat. They got to the check-in with five minutes to go. And they caught three and beat us by an inch. Ugh. And I would say, honestly, of all the experiences that I've had, that was the most formative. Because just when I started to think, you know, hey, I'm, I'm pretty hot shit. I learned that that was not the case. Yes. And and it was, so John and I from there, I mean, we were like, we were possessed. I mean, it was, it was, you know, what'd serious. You, what'd you do differently to, to become, I'm just going to 
say this. I mean, Del Brown got 500 some permit. Yeah, 513. 513. What's cause he have? I don't know. Charlie Cause has got three, a bunch. Three something but, probably. But look, just for the sake of the audience and understanding who you are, I think it was just last week you were at 199 and now you're at 203, maybe yeah. 206. Have no, you got to no. catch another three still, the last still, eight still, or so? Still at 203. <laughs> yeah. But you're probably the best saltwater fly fisherman alive right now. You might not yeah. have caught, you know, won a bunch of tarpon tournaments, but if you look across the board at what you are doing and what you're catching, I can honestly say that that's very debatable. I, I would I would debate that with a number of people, but yeah. I'm, well, I'm just throwing no, it out that's, there. No, it's nice of you to, I, I, yeah. you know, because, yeah. Everyone's different, I mean, at-, at, at How know, to assess stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, that's- uh, But anyway, let's yeah. get back to the permit thing. Sure. So you had caught 15, got second in the tournament. Yeah. How, so how possessed were you? Because I know is in the when I was in my tarpon scene thing, I didn't sleep for ten years. Yeah, um, I mean, I I remember um, I was obsessed enough that that year we won. The, I won the Del Brown with Aaron, and it was like I remember it felt very transactional. Like it was okay, we won, like that's great, but now now it comes the Merkin. I mean, we were we were so focused on that tournament because of the, the pain, you know, of losing it, that um, even winning the Dell Brown, which is a major in its own right, felt like sort of a, like a speed bump, you know? Um, and we, we started fishing a lot. We started fishing, we started tracking the number of fish we caught per day of effort. Um, we started weighing our flies. Um, actually the first time we'd done that was in the March Merkin, and a guy, a friend of mine and a client of John, Steve Jacobs, had given John a gram scale. And of course, I already had a gram <laughs> scale, so I didn't need to get you one. Three or four of them. Yeah, no, just just the one, <laughs> just the one. Um, and uh, so, so we started working on that, like pretty. I mean, it, we were we were obsessed to the point where I think my wife like talked to me about it and was well, like, "Well, let me ask you this: Are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> who who set the uh, the standard?" of how much a, a permit fly should weigh. Well, I mean, for you know, us- you're, you're weighing a fly, yeah. so how do you know what the ideal well, weight is? The idea is to to get a, a point of reference and then compare, um, you know, you find a fly that, if you weigh all your flies- That's been working. Yeah, if you weigh all your flies and you say, okay, that one's really good, you know that that weight is a weight that you like in those conditions. So it's the idea that when you know, in the moment when you're fishing, your brain kind of lies to you and you say, oh, I think this is, I think this is okay. This is the right weight. But a lot of times, you know, the fly, a permit fly, it's vertical travel is, is very important and weight affects that obviously. So the less, the more data we had, the more we felt like we had control over what the fly was doing in the water. Um, and so we, we just became like obsessed with like that that repeatability. You know? Would you change the fly depending on the water depth and current? We we no, we don't. It was just pretty standard. It was standard because we knew what it would do. So, you know, it's it, it, the, our flies became pretty light um, because we felt like we could fish a light fly in shallow water easier than we could fish a heavy fly in shallow water. Also, we it's also, gonna land lighter. Yeah, it's going to land lighter. And we used brighter, lighter flies. So brighter in color and lighter in weight. Um, and ag again, you know, given, you know, five permit shots, two of them might be deep. One of them's going to be medium and two are going to be shallow. We felt like we had a better shot at all five with a light fly than we did with a heavier fly. It's true that if, you know, if you're in four feet of water and the fish is getting it on the bottom, you want to throw a heavy fly. It's, it's easier to hook that fish with a heavy fly. Right. But if you don't know if you're going to see that or a fish tailing, I'd rather have a light fly. At least you have a good shot at the shallow fish and you can you can throw a little farther and let, let it sink down. It's similar to what you were doing with the toad, right. with tarpon, where the, I, we always used to say the time between when the fly lands and the fish bites it increased for us by about like 100 or 200% or longer. Um, that we had that little extra buffer of time. So it used to be we'd throw these heavy flies and as soon as it hit, the fish would spin around and next thing you knew, you'd hooked one. But then it got to a point where we were throwing the fly and kind of waiting and the fish would Letting see it. Letting it marinate, Yeah, and, and, then, and then you'd see the fish, you'd strip and you'd go down on it, you'd hook them. So you had this like little bit of time 
And with permit, it's it's less than tarpon. I mean, tarpon, as you know, you can throw the fly out and you can, I mean, you can't eat a sandwich, but you can, you know, you can fix your line and then look and you say, okay, I'm still in play and start right. stripping it, you know. <laughs> Um, what uh, when did you get when did you start catching a bunch of your fish waiting? That and, was in, and, and what's the difference? Why is waiting so effective more so than fishing out of a boat? Um, so we started waiting in 2015. It was that was the year the following year in the market, and it was slick calm, and we caught four fish, and we caught every one of them waiting. And we did it at that point because we didn't know how else to to get them. I think we'd caught a few waiting before that. How deep of water are we speaking about? I mean, at, at that point, it was sort of like below the knee to crotch height. Yeah. Um, I mean, if it's if it's slick and the fish are moving at all, you can see them sort of creasing along the surface and you know, making some, some sort of indication of where they're at. Um, That's gotta be so exciting. Yeah. It's, a, I mean, I mean, it's so organic. Yeah. You, you don't have a boat. You're not, nobody's telling you well, where you can, you can stop when you're waiting too. one of the big issues is if, if you're pulling a boat, you, you know, know, push pull. Yeah. I mean, you, you push the, but this, there's a body in motion now. Right. And ideally for the shot, I mean, best case scenario, you want to stop completely. Otherwise you're, you know, feeding slack in if you're approaching the fish. Um, but with waiting, you can you can stop and you can change directions. I mean, imagine if you were pulling a boat, and you could just stop moving without and just and then just go side ninety degrees and then start moving again. And I mean, you can't. It's impossible. Yeah, and you can do that much easier waiting. Right. Um, so I think it's more that than the approach. I mean, it's hard, right? The, the fish getting out of the boat quietly, getting back into the boat, um, understanding where the fish is going to be, right, and sort of getting you know, past it and then different bottoms, different, it's hard to, to wait on. But. Has that changed the game? Do you think you see other I mean, guys we, waiting out there? We were, I mean, we were definitely not the first people to wade, but using it as an approach where Especially I, I would say now, yeah, in a tournament or, or outside of it, I would say now, like we, we have two different ways that we fish. One of them is if we see a fish, we are going to wade. And that's the shot that we're looking to take. That's the um, one you want. Yeah. A, waiting, so you'll get to a, a waiting shot. Yeah. And you'll get to a place and you'll say, okay, like, that's what we're doing. We're looking for a waiting shot here. Um, and, and you do, I think a lot of times what we used to do is we'd say, well, we'll wade if, you know, but now there's no condition on it. Like, that's what we want to do. And that means sometimes you get out of the boat too soon or a fish is too close and you get out of the boat Spook. and or you, you can't even make your back cast because the boat's behind you. Right. Um, and that happens too. So you, you give up shots that way. But yeah, I mean, that's what we're looking Show me to the do. type of fly that you're throwing now. And and why do most people yeah. have, you know, struggle so much to catch permit on fly? Um, you know, so that's, what do you call this? That's the Skoke's strong arm? Skoke strong arm, yeah. And so a little backstory on that. Dave Skoke is a friend of mine from the Northeast and he was tying flies for the shop. And so that was the fly that we ended up using in the, in the 2015 in all the Merkins we've won. And he designed this yeah. with the, with the strong yeah. arm. Yeah. And the idea is that that claw comes sort of as the fly rods hook point up, right? The claw being tied up the hook shank helps to flip the fly. Because if you just, if you just tie that claw straight out the back and you put the yarn on the other side, it'll ride hook point down. So with that lighter weight, like those are probably extra small eyes. Um, and uh, in order for that fly to ride and like track perfectly straight, because if you if you make a cast at a fish and you pick it up to represent, if the fly spins, they, they don't really like that. They're really and aware. And this fly's pretty flat. Exactly. And so that claw acts like a parachute kind of, mm -hmm. like it, it, you know, keeps the water um, from passing over it quickly. So what it'll do is you'll throw it hook point down and it'll immediately flip over. Like if you cut the lead off that fly, it still, it still rides hook point up. Interesting. Yeah. And like the toad you were talking about earlier. Yeah. Same deal. Bit. Yeah. Right. What, uh, do you strip this or just let it fall? Um, I mean, both. You slide it? You can, you can, I, I usually try to strip to get their attention and then to close the deal, you let it drop. And the idea is that if the drop is a trigger for them, the lightweight gives them a longer duration of the drop. Right. So it's, it's a little less concentrated, but y you have more of it to work with. Do you wait for the tail to, to shake when that, when that permit tips down on it? No, they don't always tail on a fly. They eat at midwater column a lot. They do. Yeah. I mean, in general, a permit will sort of wiggle when, when, they, when, they, when they eat a when fly. When they bite it. Because yeah. Kilpatrick told me that before the Del yeah. Brown one year. Yeah. 
I'd um, say he was dead right about that. Yeah, and he said you they, can see it. They like it's like they it almost looks like they run into a wall, and they like compress. You know, like they 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 kind of they could, what they're doing is they're stopping, and it looks like their body is kind of like contract, like their tail's still moving. You know, um, but I think they're just that's how what they're doing is they're they're bearing down on it. You know, they right. get their their face down, and as they they're pushing. So they're digging them, it out of the sand. That's how. But they're see, kicking. I don't. I don't think they're they're digging into the sand just to eating, eat that. I yeah. think they're just they're just trying to swim past it. So the effect is that their tail is moving. Right. And they're they're trying. They have their pec fins out, so they don't cover too much ground. So they're just kind of like I, I don't know. They, they definitely wiggle though. That's my always been my theory about it. Is they're trying Doug to, told me just don't strip strike until you see the tail yeah. do this. Yeah. Is that a, is that like a cardinal rule? I'm, I mean, I, that's not a, <laughs> not a if, look, the, anything Doug Kilpatrick <laughs> says about permit fishing. I would say is a rule for sure. <laughs> no. Yeah. I, there's a, there's a, I think there's a, there's a, there's a new boss. There's a new captain. There's a new captain in town. <laughs> um, let's get back to maybe some, some tarpon stuff. Sure. Unless there any, there's anything more about, about permit fishing you'd like to say. I, I mean, mean, I, I love permit and I, I, I could talk about them forever, but I think we've covered some. Is there something that might give the audience like something to think about that might help them catch a, a, the permit that they've never caught or want, want to catch? Um, I mean, I, not. I would say paying attention to where your fly is in the water column is really important, um, because with with tarpon, it's it's all geometry, right? But tarpon is in a lot of cases, it's kind of two D. There's length and and sort of left right. Right. Um, but you know, with with permit, there's this third sort of Z axis where you have to now think about where the fly is, and an, an awareness of that is what I think the weighing the flies thing was, was a part of, or a, an attempt to be aware of that. Um, but that would be the only, the only, I mean, get right. a good guide. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and listen, Yeah, pay attention. Yeah. And go out, go out when the weather's bad. Like don't, you know, don't wait for the days when it's 15 and sunny and, you know. Yeah. You know, the also thing is that I think is really huge in what we do is that you have to, it's imperative, imperative to have casting dexterity. Yeah. Right hand, left hand, and that's what Steve was saying. There's mm -hmm. no better person to get the fly where it needs to get than you. Yeah. And a lot of people don't practice. They get down here. They've been waiting all year to go tarpon fishing or permit fishing or bone fishing. They get out there and it's blowing 20. Or they, they practice the wrong stuff. They Yeah, exactly yeah. I right. I mean, I give a lot of lessons. And one of the things that I – I can take pretty much any student and say, okay, like there's a white spot in the park. I give them in, in the park these lessons. And, you know, I'll say strip in all the line. And, and start making a cast out to, you know, that white spot. Let's say it's a fish and we're pretending it's going left. And every person without fail, they make a cast and they're a little bit short and they strip in five or 10 feet of line. And then they start their cast over with 20 feet of line. But making that transition from having a short line to a long line is, is really important. And it's something that I don't think people really practice. And you see it a bunch when you know, there's a tarpon or a, a, a permit or whatever kind of fish in front of someone and they start, they just can't get it out there. But right. guys like you, and I've seen you do this, you you flip the fly into the water and you kind of let some line slip and you pop it back and you pop it forward really fast. Bop, bop, and then your load whole it. cadence changes because now you're ca you've got that line out to load the rod. You have weight. And most people, when they practice casting, they you go to like these fly fishing shows and everyone's got all this line out. And no one ever practices. Right. And it's they say, oh, I practice the short cast. But they're not picking it. You're not aerializing 20 feet. Right. Start with a foot of line out of the rod tip. Right. And g see how quickly you can get to the point where you have 15 or 20 feet of line out. That that transition is really When important. you're fishing on the bow, mm. waiting for a shot, how much fly line do you have out of your rod? Like an inch. That's really? Yeah. I, I'm a fly dragger. So I hold the rod kind of like this. And I just let the fly... Hang, like it, hang, hang in, in the, the grass in the water, and I, I, I flick it back and forth <laughs> to keep the like, grass like off a, your hook. So like a like a horse, you know, with its tail with the flies. Do you it. really? Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. Because yeah. I'll have like, and then I just leave it in the water and kind of like, like lets it let that drag pull the line out, kind of. But right. anyway, because I'll have like at least I I always say have at least nine feet of fly line right out of your tip, maybe a little bit more. Sure. And then you have a twelve foot leader. So when I when I first flip it forward. You've got into the water. I got water load and I got line feet, load. Yeah, I can go one false cast back, and right. you can already get the sixty feet or whatever. Yeah. I think with a longer leader, I mean, we fished you know leaders that are like fifteen feet or more. Um, 
I mean, I, we don't fish like 20 foot leaders, but definitely for, for permit, maybe like 15, 14 to 17, even oh, 18. Yeah. Cause those heavy flies will turn over the leader a little bit better. Do you find certain rods? And I've noticed this in the past over the years, fishing different rods. Some, yeah. a lot of rods, if you'll notice, they're almost too stiff. Yeah. Because when you go to a casting pond, everybody wants to see how far they can. Well, I think that's what what goes back to what what I was saying before is like you know these these all these guys want to throw with line out. I, I agree with you completely. These these really stiff rods they prevent that transition from happening because they don't load. It's a great casting rod, but it's totally. not a great fishing rod. Yep. You know, Absolutely. one of the most important casts is that 30 foot late in the day. Yep. Or even in the middle of the day. Yeah. And if the rod's too stiff, you can't get the fly there. Exactly. And if you can, that transition, because you're you, you're making this exponential increase in the amount of force you're putting, the, the amount of load you're putting into the rod. As you let, you know, you have five feet of fly line out and then 15 feet of fly line, the rod bends a lot more. Right. Um, and those stiff rods, it's it's actually harder to make that transition because they don't bend as much. Exactly. So your timing has to be that more, that much more precise. Yeah. yeah. But I agree with that point completely. I mean, there's a few rods, you know, that are made today that I think really consider what we're talking about. And there's some that don't. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, what about, you know, we're talking about, you know, get, I'm going to get to the tarpon thing and catching records, but sure. right now I want to talk a little bit about tackle because I know that, that you fish a reel, uh, that has one full revolution. You have full drag. Yeah, Makos. Yeah, which which is what I like with our reels as well, the Hardy reels, and yep. the fact that I don't know if you do this or not, but I've never been a drag guy. I've always set my pre drag like three pounds, and that's all I fish with because I, I use I, your finger I, pressure. I pinch, sure, my fingers hang onto the fly line. Yeah. But I was thinking the other day, if I were a person that used drag on my reels. And you fish your reel that's got more than one revolution to increase drag. You never know where you're at. Yeah, and, that's, and with and with one drag, one revolution to full drag, I could take a, a scale and go to five pounds and mark the top of the regulator, yeah. the drag knob, against the face, the back of the reel. Sure, that's five. Then you go to eight. In case that fish takes off offshore, you go to eight, and you got maybe a twelve pound or a ten pound mark. Yeah. And I think that if you're a fisherman and you use drag, there's no way you can fish any other reel than a reel that's got one revolution for full drag. Yeah. So you can mark it as And I, I agree you with agree? that Comple completely. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say there's, I mean, look, there's a lot of great reels out there. Right. But the thing about the Makos that, that I love is I, I use nail polish and I, I make marks. It's funny you say that. I make it six, eight, and 10. Right. And because I do use the drag you know, when the fish is close to the boat often. Um, and it, it's tough when the fish gets under the boat, but it's not, again, it's that repeatability. And you can just take you know? it off too, yeah. walking around because the bow, it's, you know, and if you go got, right back If to you've 10. got a, a fish on and and I'm saying to myself, okay, with hand pressure, I'm going to put 12 pounds of pressure on that fish. I trust myself for the first half an hour, but then I get tired or I get frustrated or any number of things that happens. You know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a, you know, I'm, I'm not, not a machine. Accurate. Exactly. Right. So these marks on those Mako reels, they never change. Right. So like when I was fishing on six pound, I had marks at one, one and a half, two, two and a half, three. And that was it. And I knew exactly. And right. I remember at one point I was fighting this fish and I was like, I'm, I'm putting so much pressure on this fish. And I looked down and I said, but it's at a pound. And then I'm pulling on it as it got tired towards the end. And I'm pulling on it and I said, the fish really starts, you know, kicking off it like makes a real hard run and now i'm like oh i don't have any drag on it at all and i look down and i you know confirm like i never went over a, and the, the rod adds about two pounds right. depending on the bend of the rod so um it, it makes, gives you a nice point it makes of reference total sense yeah it really does yeah and there's so much that's out of control right i mean that's the thing about knots and and leaders and flies and and reels there's already so much of this that's totally out of your control and you're trying to you know, put in time, exactly what we have and available. You, it's so limited, you right. know, so you have to, I think it really becomes, like if you're looking to sort of tease out that last little bit, that's those details are where it, where it resides often. Right. You know. It's interesting because Nikki was telling me about how you set the, the hook catching tarpon. And what right. I do is I've experimented in the past with pulling on scales with pulleys and you know about mm -hmm. this. And 
recently I had a 12 pound barbell mm -hmm. attached to the butt section of my fly line through a pulley. And, and we lift that up to teach you how much is 12 pounds. Yeah. And that's kind of like the magical number I use with fight fish. But I stood back and if you have any sort of bend, if you go to set the hook, yep. you can pull as hard as, hard as, you, as can. you can and you can't pick that barbell up off the floor. Yeah, well, at 10 pounds monofilament, like, which the, the core of all these fly lines is, um, it'll stretch at 10%. So if the fish is, say, 60 feet away, right, you can basically reach, you know, a six foot person can reach all the way up here six and feet pull all the way back here. Before it gets tight. Before you get to 10 pounds. Yeah. yeah. And that's why, like, when you, I mean, if, if you set your drag at six pounds and you, you know, you hook a, or eight pounds, you hook a fish, you set the hook, and the fish runs off, and he hits the reel. Your your intuition says, well, he's going to start spinning the reel. But what happens instead is you get this like this awful like screeching noise, and it's the it's the the guides humming against the line, and the line's going through the water. The drag, and, and because the fish isn't, they're rarely running dead Straight, away from you. Right. They're kind of going at an angle, and you can feel that stretch. And that's why like one of the things that you do when you're fighting fish is you, you talk about being a spring and what you're doing is you're dealing with that stretch and you're maintaining that stretch throughout each pull on the fish. So as you, you, you sort of reach your arms out and I'll do that too when I'm fighting a fish, reach all the way out and then pull in like this and you don't take any drag and then you bend the rod. And now the, the handle starts spinning if you've got eight or 10 pounds of drag. How much do you have your, your hand on the fly line when you're fighting fish? It depends. I mean, I do it both ways. I'll right. do hand pressure or drag pressure. Right. Um, and I'll usually decide to do one or the other, depending on the conditions, the size of the fish. Um, I mean, if, I, I do think if you want to catch a fish really fast, like last year in the Gold Cup, John and I hooked a giant fish with like 12 minutes to go. And we've got, we only have two hours to run back to Isla Morada and we're fishing in Key West. So I said to John, like, we're going to have to, you know, Maximize we're going to have to, you know, whatever, pop them or stop them. And we caught a 132, I think, in like seven minutes or something. I mean, Just that's went to 12 pounds. Of, yeah, that, no, that's the drag. I mean, you took him right to the boat. Yeah, grabbed, it, grabbed him and strapped him and everything. Yeah, that's really fast. Yeah. Because but that was where I just I just maxed out. the. I went to 12 pounds of drag and Not I said, it, it's either going to, you know, one of two things is going to happen. <laughs> uh, but I think it's hard to do that with hand pressure because at some point you're inaccurate. If the fish, if the fish decides to, you know, shoot off, you let go with your hands and then you revert to that drag. Whereas, you know, if you set the drag super hard, that fish starts to run and they just keel over because it's like having right. your hands on there the whole time. Right. The nice thing about hand pressure is you can change the angle without pulling his head around. That's right. the one thing with the heavy drag settings, it's hard. Right. You start pulling on them and you just end up pulling them towards the boat. I never liked a heavy drag setting because I never liked to have a fish jump out of the water and land against the heavy resistance. I've lost very few like that. It's amazing what you can get away with. I mean, it does happen, yeah. but you know, assuming you've got a little bend in the rod, I mean, they can, they can run off and come flying out of the water and land on the tippet. And as long as the drag is a good drag, right. they're not gonna, What'll happen is as soon as they put more than 10 pounds of pressure on it, and most most like 16 that you buy in the store tests at like 20. Right. So it's 50% of the drag mm -hmm. setting. You think about these sailfish tournaments. These guys are using 40% of the setting on their on their rigs when they're fighting those sailfish. They set the drags at so for 20 pound test, it's eight pounds of eight drag. Pounds, right. And that's a fish that's coming crashing out of the water and a big sword on its face. You right. Know? That's a lot. Yeah. Let's let's go into this record you just caught. Sure. That you chased for nine years. Yeah. Um, so it's a hundred and forty three pound fish. The one, previous. Yeah, one forty point three. One forty point three. If you want to give me three pounds, <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll take it. Yeah. I'm not gonna turn it down. It, I mean, that's just a an unbelievable fish. The previous record was eighty eight. Mm. Um, tell me a little bit about about the wars you waged to catch that fish over those nine Man. years. So the the first time I went up there with Steve, um, you know, I, I started fishing with Steve because Fitz, my cousin, told me that I should fish with him. And I'd fished with Doug and some with Aaron and some with Paul Dixon for that record down here. And uh, he said, you know, you need to go talk to Steve. So I, I met Steve at a show and I, you know, he was like, I, I don't have any time. And then I went back to him and said, well, my, you know, my cousin felt really awkward. My cousin tells me that I should tell you that he told me to tell you that we should, yeah, you fish, should fish together. Fish and I, I think he, I don't think he paid much attention to that. I think he appreciated the fact that I, I returned. And uh, 
so we I went up there with Aaron Snell, um, who's a guy down here, a great friend of mine, and uh, first tarp and I ever hooked with Steve. Like I have, I mean, we had it next to the boat, and Steve reached out with a gaff, and it bounced off him, and it came back with some scales on it. And so, of course, I was like, well, this is going to be easy, right? Nine years typical, later. Typical Nathaniel, like <laughs> calculus there, like, no problem. And um, the next time I fished with him was the following year, and it was just me and him. And it was, uh, we were back in one of those, you know, bays that he fishes in. Um, threw out there at this fish that was laying there, and it was actually a different fish that ate it. We saw this little tail sticking up, and I threw the fly, and we hooked this thing that was... I don't know. I mean, to, it, it's it's tough to talk about how big it is because it doesn't matter. But we fought a fish for 13 hours, um, and we ended up losing it. At I think we hooked it at 1 p.m. We lost it at uh, like 3 a.m. or something. Um, and if we'd had a third person on the boat, it, I mean, there were a number of times when it was right next to the boat. Um, but he had to put the spotlight down and get the gaff. And then too long. Yeah. So eventually the fish broke off. And what happens is the, you know, I get tired. So after. And you're a diabetic. Yeah. I'm a diabetic. So you have yeah. to have injections yes. throughout the night. Yeah. Steve took care of that. I mean, I like walked him through it, you know, but I have like two different kinds of insulin, right? Like short acting and long acting. Right. So I'm like, you know, make like double, just double checking. We're not giving, like, give me a long acting, right? And Steve, oh, he's, he's down, you know, he was like, whatever, dude, like, right. <laughs> catch that fucking thing. I don't <laughs> care if you need me to shoot you up. That's fine. Um, and, uh, and then we had, I think we've had four fights over 10 hours. Wow. Um, and, I mean, the, the thing about that is that I, I think it's very hard for people to understand, like, doing that. And it's it's hard for me to understand doing that because you don't set out to do that. I mean, the problem is that you hook some giant fish that is acting in, in a way that you don't want a fish to act. Like you want to hook a big, fat, lazy one, but you hook a, you know, one that's been going to the gym. And you know enough about the tippet to not break it off. And then at that point, you're in it for an hour and you say, well, I'm not going to break this thing off on purpose. Right. I mean, you're not, you're not trying to. And it's it's a sized fish that'll yeah. make it. Yeah. I mean, that fish that we fought, the first one, you know, Steve's estimate was 180. And I it wouldn't surprise me if it was bigger than that. I'm not going to say What'd any number. What did you think when people. you saw him jump out of the water? I said to Steve, I said, Jesus, Steve, are you ready to catch a 150? <laughs> and he goes, you know how Steve. Try 180. Steve was like, you, you want to know something? I'll tell you something. <laughs> I know. That, he said that fish hasn't been 150 for a long time, and it was. But you know, we've worked so hard to hook it. I mean, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna break it off. Right. And it was one in the afternoon, and like I said, it actually would have been a good fish if we'd had, you know, if Chad had been with us or someone to gaff it. But, um, and then Jason Trotweiser was coming with us for a number of years, and uh, we had a couple of fights that were I don't know, 10, 11 hours with him. That's crazy. And uh, did you ever get to the point like maybe this is not possible? I mean, it, that's a, that's a, an interesting question because I would think logically that I should have considered that because all the evidence <laughs> pointed in that direction. <laughs> but um, no, no, I never, I never thought about quitting. I never, it never occurred to me not to do it. Yeah, I, I don't see that in you or Steve. Yeah, and I, I think that it became like, look, more possessive to get. Yeah, this and fish. and it also became like we we enjoyed it. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was, it's fun to try. You're and doing the Goggins. The what? The Goggins, the David Goggins. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Isn't <laughs> he the fish. guy that does like 10,000 pull-ups or something? Yeah, 4,000 oh, in like 12 hours or something. Good for him. Yeah. Um, my back hurts just thinking about that. Um, but, but, I, but I see that you guys were the perfect match for this. Yeah. I mean, and, and look, Chad became, he, he came late to the team, but Chad was an absolute, you know, benefit. Essential. Yeah, he... He really like took the the attitude of like being a proactive member of the team, and th there's no way that you can catch a fish like that with just. I mean, I didn't catch that fish, right? Like Steve, me, and Chad in, in a, a totally team. equivalent, like equilateral way, sure. caught that fish together. Um, and it, we were our efforts were contributed to by you know Jason and Doug and everyone that was sort of a part of this over the years that like I would talk to about it. And, um, but yeah, I mean, the, the problem with that is you're, you're building this machine and in order for it to work, everything has to work perfectly. 
and it only has to work one time. So what what's sort of seductive about it is you say, well, yeah, it's really hard, but you know, then you come really close. I mean, we had a fish two years ago that that we gaffed and it came off the gaff. And you realize in that moment, like, okay, this is, you know, th this could happen. You know, you really could do it. Um, and, but it, so, so again, it's the, the chances of it working are very low, but it doesn't need to work more than one time. Right. And if, if it and does, that's key. yeah, it is. And you have to, you have to like avail yourself to that possibility. Right. Uh, well, tell me about, uh, tell me about this fish that you eventually and finally caught. Well, so, um, I want to hear, I so want to hear. We this had, is a great story. It is a good story. We, we had, um, uh, we had, I had fished with Chad down here and he was with John and I, when I caught the two pound, when we caught the two pound permit record, because with those light line records, having a third person to help, you know, land the fish is really important. And so he came down here fishing with me and John for two days. And we were supposed to fish with Steve Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, and we fished with John Tuesday and Wednesday, and there was a front coming through on Friday. So we called Steve and we said, look, we'll just come up there for one day on Thursday because he wasn't booked and let's just do that. So I drove up on Thursday night after fishing for two days and uh, I almost got a ticket because I was driving in the wrong lane. I thought it was a turning lane there in Everglades City and I did it right in front of a cop. <laughs> um, and so he let me go. And uh, and then so we, we went out and the first fish we threw out in the morning, we hooked and it jumped off. And then the fish were around, but they were being pretty tough. And um, so we had lunch. It was about one o'clock. See a fish laying there, throw the fly over it, and it eats the fly. It comes out of the water, and it, Steve pulls over, and it's about a hundred pounds. And the record's eighty-eight. And we're looking at this thing, and we're like, "Man, do you want to? What do you think?" It's like, "I don't know. What do you think?" And finally, you know, word word from above came up that it was not. It wasn't a hundred pounds for sure. Um, so we broke it off and we pulled back in and we're fishing and Steve said, you know, I think I see a little, a little, is there, is there something right there? And I was like, Steve, I, I think I said to him, like, Steve, I don't fucking know, but it's free to try. Right. You know? <laughs> so I, I threw a cast over this little smudge and I just start bringing it back and you can see like that, that big tail, like that big kick. orange kick, you know, and it comes up and you can see its face and it eats it real, real fast and kind of like eats it fast and then fades away. And I was like... Yeah, Steve, looks like you were right. It was a fish. And the fish took, like, it It just started screaming out towards the mouth of this bay that we were in. And it probably took, it was probably 150 yards away from the boat at its farthest. By the time we caught up with it, it was over 300 yards away. And on six, I'm surprised line drag didn't break it. That, that's, that was very surprising, too, to me. Um, but so after that really long run... Um, you know, Steve's, uh, Chad strapped into the gaff and, uh, he's not strapped in, but he's got a, a like a leash around his, uh, his wrist. And, uh, but after that long run, it was like, we'd fought the fish for 10 or 12 hours I mean, the fish was tired and rolling a lot. And, you know, you've had that happen in a tournament where you hook a fish and it just takes off and screaming across some, you know, some bay or something. And as soon as you catch up with it, you start pulling on them and they flip over and you can catch them pretty good. Right. Um, so what we were doing is the fish would come up and roll and we were we were trying to time its rolls, you know, and each time we would, you know, you'd see the line angle start to change. And Chad right. and I are like, OK, it's coming up. come on, Steve, come on. Go. Steve's getting closer and the fish would duck underneath the bow of the boat. Steve would put the boat in reverse and the fish would squirt out and then it would roll about 20 or 30 feet away. So that was the pattern for a while. And uh, so we have two gaffs. One is Steve's like homo sassa, you know, gold cup winning gaff that he Four had given Chad. Old. Yeah. He'd, he'd given Chad that gaff as a gift. And then I had a gaff that he gave me, which was a gaff that he used to gaff Dell's 41 pound permit on, on eight. Wow. And I think the 24 pound permit as well on four. Um, but it was a big, it was a, a sufficient gaff to use for a tarpon. And uh, so we threw that on the boat in the morning as an afterthought. We usually only bring one gaff. But I said, let, you know, I've carried this thing around with me. It's like, I want to use it. Let's, let's bring it. Why not? The um, stars were perf yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah. And, here, and here are the alignment of the stars. <laughs> so, um, so, so finally the fish, like, it's getting pretty tired. And it, you could see the angle of the line start to change, which is, by the way, when you're fighting these fish, and you know that, your whole world is like the leader. 
and and I'm looking also at, there's Chad and the leader and the fish and so I see the angle of the leader start to change and we start chirping and we say you know Steve get the get the boat going forward and he gets forward and the fish comes up and rolls and it angles towards the boat and I was like man you're bad angle you're, fish. you're gonna get it <laughs> and you know Chad he reaches the and the gas too heavy to hold out so he's got to sort of extend it out to where he wants it and then let gravity take over so he's got this one fluid motion to do and he lifts the gaff up and I can see the angle and I'm like, yes, yes, yes. And then sure enough, the point gets over the fish and I watch it drop on the other side of it. And I said, okay, yes, that's, baby. that's it. So Steve, you know, puts the boat in reverse and Chad just hits home. They're really hard to penetrate. And, uh, you know, Chad just keeps coming with the, with the gaff and he keeps coming and keeps coming. And all of a sudden the fish is like, my reel is just screaming and I'm looking out and I'm seeing the fish jumping and I run to the back of the platform because I didn't know what, like, I didn't know what was going on. And I was worried that the fish had gone under the boat and Chad is still in the bow and that fish has snapped half inch stainless steel right at the base of where the gaff head enters the handle. Oh my God. Um, and so it's, it's broken and I'm, we're all looking around like, why, like, why is, why is Chad in the boat? Why is the fish in the water? Like, it's either right. both of them in the boat or both of them in the water, but it can't be at this point that, that they're separated is strange. Yeah, right. And uh, so um, what had happened is the gaff had broken, the fish jumped and there was blood everywhere. And it, be it became obvious that the fish was wounded um, and that the gaff had broken. So we, we take off the first gaff and he puts on my gaff. And now I'm worried that the fish is going to is gonna die and we're in 15 feet of water. At this point, it's been out in one of these passes out there in Chukaluski. Um And, you know, the fish like, the fish finally gets close to Chad and he kind of hits it again with the gaff and the gaff bounces off. And then the fish swims out and he's up on his side. And uh, I'm taking 15 minutes of like pretty tense, you know, yeah, fishing and sure. compressing him down. And I, I look over and the fish is on its side and its mouth is hanging open and the, the shock, the fish was hooked in the upper left and the shock is around the hinge of his jaw and the class is going right through his mouth. Oh, it's over. And I'm thinking like, you know, of all the fucking things to happen to cost us this fish. And, and look, I'll say this too, you know, you don't kill many fish doing this. I mean, it's incredibly rare that you get to the point where you're going to. Um, and you don't want to kill them. That's not the point. The point is that you want to catch this record and the killing of them is a byproduct. And the idea of a fish dying and the record being disallowed is, is very offensive to any record fisherman. You take sure. no pleasure in that. So, um, so I, I have to, I threaded the class through its mouth. And, uh, at that point I could see like the, the shock coming up like, victorious, You're you back know, in the and game. I'm like, <laughs> so we get next to the, to the fish and Chad's like, you know, we're, Steve and I are both like, you know, grab him, gaff him, grab him, gaff him. And Chad hits him again and snugs him up against the boat. And at that point, the fish is secured. So I get down and I get my arm through its gills and we pull the thing into the boat. Um, yeah, it was it was an amazing experience, you know, in, in every way. Right. I mean, I, I, it's hard. It's hard to, like, describe that that amount of effort and the amount of difficulty that goes in to that all coming together in that right. moment. Over nine years. Yeah. How long did that fight take? 50 minutes. Yeah. So under an hour in the end. And then you, you sent it off to BTT to have yeah, the scientists. Well, it was FIU. Hey, yeah. Okay. Um, I called a friend who worked at BTT and they, uh, they, they recovered the otoliths and the eye lenses, which they can do some um, analysis of. And how old was that fish? 16 years old. 143. You know what's interesting? That's pretty young, pretty young fish for 143. Yeah, it was it was a, a very big fish for its age. Right. Yeah. Because at the John Shedd Aquarium in Chicago in 1935, they put a 59 inch tarpon into that aquarium that was caught in the wild. Right. 63 years later, in 1998, mm -hmm. making it 73 years old, it jumped out of the aquarium and died. I don't blame it. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> But a lot of people never thought that these fish lived to yeah. 80 years old, 70, 80 years old. Did it get much old. bigger? You know, they never mentioned the size of it. Yeah, because um, I've heard that these fish will like sort of grow to, to a, they'll stop growing if they can't get bigger. Right. If the um, space does not allow yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what an adventure you've had. What yeah. a wild ride. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely been a wild ride for sure.
Yeah. You must feel, how do you feel now about where you, where you are in your life? I feel good. I mean, I, I do. I um, Victorious in so many different ways. Yeah, I mean, yes and no. You know, it's interesting about that. Like, you know, you tell that story about catching the record and it feels like that's the sort of sum of it. But I mean, I've learned a lot more from, you know, failure than, than I have the success. Um, and, you know, it, it's a great story about, you know, catching that fish, but all the years spent trying were like sort of joyous in their own way. And, and they're, they're the most like sort of valuable parts of that experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, like they say, it's not the reason, it's the journey. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And I would agree with that. What, uh, there's, it also adds a lot of humility to it, you know. Yeah. I mean, and and I, I've won some tournaments, sure, but like I've lost more tournaments than I've won, and that's probably true for almost anyone. Right. Um, and I think it's easy to focus on you know the good stuff, but I, and it's not that I enjoy failure, but but it's a part of it that I'm the growth. I'm, I'm familiar with, yeah. Right. And and so there's a there's a I think a great humility that comes with that stuff because you know what it's like when it doesn't work, right. you know. Um, what, what how how important is it for you to win a tarpon tournament at this stage? Um, I mean, I I would of course love to win a tarpon tournament, and John and I have been close a number of times. Right. So so have a lot of people. By sure. the way, um, yeah. Are I mean, you as possessed about that as, as you were with the Merkin tournament and, and the Dell Brown? Um, no, but I'm not obsessed with anything like that. I mean, I wasn't. I fished for the six pound tarpon record at that time. And I was not as obsessed with it in, in, a, in an unhealthy way as I was at the end, even though we caught it. Right. Um, so I think my, my perspective has sort of changed mm -hmm. in that I don't consider that sort of unbalanced obsession to be a necessary part of like that pursuit. Like my, my sort of approach is more based on, you know, process and repeatability and hard work. Um, but I don't feel this deep sort of need. I think after I got clean, I did. I felt like I needed to prove something. Um, and for whatever reason, I don't feel that as much now. Um, as you did prior to the, yeah, the permit. It's not means. like this like need to, right. to succeed. Yeah. Um, and well, I'll, well, I want to have fun, you yeah. know? I want to be out there and, and I fish my best when I'm having fun. Um, I wouldn't be fishing it if I wasn't trying to win it. Um, for sure. But I don't, it's not something that I, I don't think that I need that like sort of in, insecure fire to be raging in order for yeah. me to, to compete at a high level. Well, just so you know, Steve Huff was saying last night, he said, I really hope Nathaniel gets his name on the Gold Cup. Well, I, I will, uh, I will do my best I and I'm not going to quit until I do. <laughs> so, <laughs> I so if, whatever it takes. Yeah. yeah. But well, no, I don't, I don't have that like sort of, um, it doesn't keep me up at night, you know? Yeah. One more thing, Nathaniel, since we're just sitting here, we kind of wrap that up. Give us your perspective on killing a fish. You took nine years. It's a record, yeah. yes, but there are a lot of naysayers out there. They don't believe in this kind of stuff. Right. Um, it's not that we're going to be able to convince them that what we did yeah. is okay. Sure. But what we did, it's okay for us because of your yeah. perspective, which is? Well, I mean, I think that, I mean, look, you know, I... When it comes to killing a fish, something that I try to be sensitive about is how how many fish am I killing? Um, and I've killed, that's not the first tarpon that I've killed. I mean, I've killed fish. When I first moved down here, I the, one of the first tarpon I hooked got sharked. I killed that fish. I see it happen pretty regularly. Um, there is a certain amount of mortality associated with fishing in general. And tarpon are fish that are pursued by sharks and, and they are also, they, they you know, they give in sometimes. You, you let a fish go and it doesn't swim off great. Um, I mean, the, the point that I would, you know, make about killing a tarpon for the sake of a world record is, you know, I fished for nine years for that record. I probably hooked, I don't know, thousands of bites. Um, and I remember I was with Steve and Jason one time and it was pouring rain and we had like essentially no chance of hooking a tarpon. So Steve brings us to a place where there like might be a tarpon, which for Steve means a, a pretty good shot at hooking one, but we're not seeing very many and it's just pouring down rain and it's winds howling and I throw in this big black fly out there trying to, you know, farm one out of this deep little cut. And I hook a fish and it comes out of the water and it's probably like 80 pounds. 
and no one on the boat says anything. Just point the rod at the fish, tighten up, break it off, and I sit down, you know, and I open up the hatch, I get out a new fly and I put it back on and I get the thing rigged up and I'm standing back up there on the bow. And that's a fish that we would have fought if we'd been fishing on 16. So the argument to me is if you, if you disagree with killing fish, period, then anytime you're fishing for them, they might die. And I'm putting the number of fish that died in our pursuit of that world record over that period of time, not against how many we would have killed if we hadn't done anything at all, if we'd sat at home and watched Netflix. But I'm putting that number against the number we would have killed if we had just been fishing for fun on 16 or 20 and tried to catch some fish. Right. Well, and, take a, also take a look at how many fish are going to be killed this year by sharks at the Bahia Honda Warm Absolutely. Hatch. I mean, 100%. Right. If you're fishing at Bahia Honda Bridge, those, you're killing fish. You're killing fish. And I, I think that we all have an obligation to do things not only that benefit us, but that if everyone else did, it would be beneficial for the fish. And I think in the case of lightline tarpon records, if everyone was fishing on six pound, I don't think very many fish would die <laughs> because every fish that was under, I mean, let's go back to before we caught a 140. Every fish that was under 90 pounds or 100 pounds would be broken off immediately. So I think I can extrapolate from you know, if, if what for we sure. were doing and we apply, if everyone else was doing it, it would be okay. And I, I don't think, and when I say it would be okay, it would kill fewer fish. But I think people um, are looking at it, well, this is a proactive murder. Yeah. Or a proactive death with a gaff, and you... Sure. Yeah, and, and that's that's true. But I think the, um, the difference is it doesn't make... For me, there is no difference. If I, if I go to a place and I know there's sharks there, and I hook a fish, and that fish either dies while it's hooked or at some point afterwards by a shark because it can't, you know, swim fast enough away. I still killed that fish. I mean, premeditated murder, murder one, manslaughter, someone's dead at the end of all those transactions. Then it doesn't really matter to me if if someone has an excuse or not. This is like the, you know, Purdue Pharma thing. Mm -hmm. Like, did you did you right. purposely make this thing that was just like heroin or did, were you just too stupid? Does it I don't care. I don't think, I doubt that anyone does. Um, and I think it's a similar kind of thing. It, it's convenient to say, well, you know, I would never do that. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's fucked up that you're killing a fish. But, um, you know, to me, honestly, like knowing how many fish 100% did not die, none of those fish we fought for, for that long died. There's no way. Those things were strong. Trust me, they were strong. Right, right. Um, did we interrupt them? Did we really kind of like, you know, mess them up? Yeah. But those those things, I mean, you know, if you t if you take a, a a brisk walk for 12 hours, you're going to be tired, but you're not going to die. die. Yeah. Right. And I think that, uh, again, I, I think that it's very difficult for, for people to understand what would have happened otherwise. Like had we committed those same number of hours and time and, and you know, those days fishing to just going out and fishing and having fun and catching tarpon and, you know, having just a regular charter. Um, there's no question in my mind that not as many would have died, but instead many more. Right. And it's it's a difficult metric for people to really wrap their brains around. But the people having, who fish a lot, it, big fish, they will understand. Yeah, but I, I think that, I mean, look, I don't, I don't wish anybody harm if they disagree with killing a fish for a record. I mean, on some level, I disagree with it too. Um, it, it, is, it is a difficult byproduct. But I think that to, to turn this into a like us versus them kind of thing, it, it's, it's difficult because it further fractures the community. Um, and I think at the end of the day, like if I thought that, that what I was doing was doing harm to the population in a way I actually think that fishing for that record was meant that fewer fish died. Because like I said, every fish that was under 100 pounds, right before we caught that fish, we had a fish that- That we, would have been a record. That would have been a record and we didn't, we did, and, and honestly, if we'd been fishing on 16, we would have been, you know, we would have fought that fish, probably gone back in there, hooked the one we could, we would have caught them both. And even at, I think at the lower end of the spectrum, um, catch and release mortality is somewhere around like 5%. And if I, if I look at the number of fish we hooked over the years we were fishing on six pound, 
the number of fish that we subdued to the point where they wouldn't survive was zero. Right. Um, we did have a, a failed gaff attempt at a fish that may or may not have made it. But still, that's nine years of fishing with, with a good maybe angler and a, and a top guide and, and, you know, two maybe. I mean, let's be generous and say three. Yeah. But that's, I mean. That's nothing. You know, and, and like I said, I mean, I, I, I don't look at it as any different when I fish in a place and a shark eats a fish that I hooked. I killed that fish. I mean, you, I can say all I wanted. that Well, the shark did it and my finger. I didn't mean for that to happen. But that fish is dead because of me. Mm -hmm. And just because I didn't intend that doesn't mean that I didn't do it. And I think that the the conversation has has shifted toward people saying, well, you know, I wouldn't do that and you're killing fish. And you say, well, kind of, but not really. I mean, we're not out there. Like, it's not a very, like, you know, death intensive undertaking. I mean, it is, it is what it is. You are killing a fish, but right. there's no, there's no premeditation about it. You're not, I mean, you're not, I mean, there is, sorry, there is enough premeditation that you know what you're doing. Right. Um, and, and like I said, I wish that people understood that when, when these things were brought up, because it, it's just not, I, like I said, I'm, I'm quite sure that we killed fewer fish for fishing for that record. Oh, for sure. Yeah. What's your greatest success when you look back at the whole thing? Um, I mean, getting clean or asking my wife to marry me. I, I love my wife, and I think I made a really good call. She's a great, a great person. Um, between those two things, I mean, I, I would have to pick getting clean because um, that was like a, you right. know, a thing that allowed the other to happen. For sure. Um, but, but those two things are, are pretty closely related. Any words of advice for somebody out there that might be struggling? Um, yeah, I mean, don't, don't think that it's impossible, you know? Um, I think the, my, my experience was characterized by me not knowing that, that there was life on the other side of it. Um, and, and there absolutely is. I mean, it's, it's difficult for me to talk about that time from where I am now and carry with it, like the weight of what I was, you know, I was not a nice guy. I was a, I was a liar and a, and a thief and a, you know, a junkie and a fiend. Um, and, and there is life on the other side of that. Um, and it was difficult for me to see at that time. Um, and, and I, you know, that's the honest truth. Like it was, it's easy to look at that and sort of characterize it as, um, you know, this sort of like rock and roll, like leather jacket, like fuck you, Officer Leroy story. But it wasn't that. It was it was it was bad and it was sad and it was um it was sort of demeaning, you know, for me. Um, but that there is unquestionably the ability for anyone to get to the other side of that and to to regain some self respect and earn that. It is is if I, I mean, I hate to say the cliche, but if, if I can do it coming from there. With, with how bad it was for me, then I, there's no question in my mind that anyone else can do it. And I've seen a lot of people do it themselves. Did you have professionals help you or just friends? Just just friends, just yeah. Friends. Did yeah. God play a role in any way? Um, I mean, I, you know, the God of my understanding. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Whatever whatever they, they may or may not be. Yeah. yeah. Um, but no, I, I did not... I didn't look to to that any more than I was asked to, and I found what what of it I needed, and you know left the rest. But there was not no for me it was not a uh, like a, a sort of a bonding with with God. Right. But it was I, I do think there was a, the realization that I came to was that what I did mattered, like how I how I lived and and what I did how I treated people, how I treated myself, being honest and open-minded and willing, that those things mattered. Um, and I didn't think that they did because the world that I had created around myself didn't really, mm -hmm. um, it didn't really reflect that, that importance. But I've, I've learned since that, you know, I'm, I'm much more powerful than I, than I thought in some ways. And in other ways I have less control than I ever, than I ever thought possible. Um, yeah. How hard was it on a daily basis with a conscious 
knowing you had to fix this demon? Um, I mean, you know, you store acorns one at a time for the winter, you know. Um, so each one by itself isn't that heavy, I guess. That's the, you know, one day at a time is manageable. Right. Um, and what do you do daily? Do you have meetings? Do you have... Yeah, I mean, again, there's... Uh, con conversations daily? Yeah, I mean, I, I have to be a little cautious of discussing that stuff publicly. Right. Um, you know, Is there, are those you programs risk, tend to be anonymous for a reason. Are, are yeah. you at risk of falling into that abyss again? Um, I mean, that... Imagine if I gave something to you and I handed you this little piece of metal and I said, okay, right, Andy, here's a ball bearing. Um, whatever you do, don't, don't drop it. If you drop it, your life's going to go to hell. You're going to lose your relationship with your kids. You're going to, you're going to lose your love for fishing. But the only thing you have to do is just not drop it. And the key is you got to carry it with you all the time. You know, I mean, you don't want to drop it and you don't have any risk of doing it, but you also have to understand its importance. And you can't just, you know, put it in a safety deposit box. So I'm conscious of it to the extent that I need to be, but it doesn't, it doesn't rule my like day-to-day -day life. But if, you know, I have to, I have to remember the importance of that. Um, because if I forget that, or if I get, you know, I mean, all it takes is motive and opportunity, right? right. But I, but I don't, I mean, in fairness, I don't, sit around worried about, about relapse. You right. know, I've done a lot of work and, um, that work has been, has, has proven at this point, has been proven at this point to be the right work. Right. Um, so it's a fine line, right? It's a balance between, it's like fighting a permit that, you know, is going to win a <laughs> tournament. Like don't pull too hard. Like, yeah, I know, but like, and, you, and you're probably not going to break it off. Like you, you know, it's next to the boat. It's not a big fish. All you have to do is get it into the net. Um, but the stakes are high, so right. make sure that you keep your wits about you. Yeah. yeah. But no, I don't. I don't worry about that. Good. I'm. I've. I've done that work. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Nathaniel, yes. thank you for joining us and and, and being so brutally honest. You know, with your demons and your successes. Hey, and man. That, that's that, it to, for me not to discuss that stuff would be disingenuous. And and I'm uh, I'm happy to do it. And and it doesn't. It, it's not something that I'm. I mean, I'm embarrassed by. Um, but I'm also, it, it, to, to shy away from that would be completely, I, I would be not. You're not that guy. Yeah. You're and and I'm guy. happy to discuss it because I think the truth is about what addiction is and, and, and what it did to me and what it took to get out of that is it's the truth and right. it matters. I think the truth is, is an important thing that you know, it, I, I dare say in today's right. world is, is often overlooked. Yeah. Well, and what you've gone, what you've done since then, since that success in the world of fishing is just enormous. Yeah. Well, you thank know. you. So anyway, we're, we're proud to, and honored to have you as our friend. And I look Likewise. up to you every day. Yeah. Thank you. All thank right. you. Thank you, bud. You got it. When I saw its story.